BBOR Black Box Online Radio coming to you from West Virginia. Black Box Ned 88 on Instagram for the bonus podcast. And welcome to BBOR, the home of True Crime Talk Radio and your premier destination for unsolved mysteries, criminal psychology, and exploring the dark side of cyberspace. My name is Ned DeHaan, and I am your host as well as the creator of Astro Psych 400 here on YouTube, and regular contributor to the Zodiac Killer channel. And a great way to support these shows is just by listening to some more content. But you can also go over to Amazon.com and have a look at the book Killer on a White Horse, written by me, Ned Dahan. It is a novel, murder mystery, inspired by the Zodiac Manson connection, but it is indeed fictional. However, who doesn't love a good mystery? And there is always the Teespring page. Feel free to check out some of the merchandise. And remember, being weird is not a crime. Let the show begin. Okay, hello everybody. Today is Friday. Another Anything Goes Friday. Welcome to the show. In this episode, I'm going to be talking about the thought patterns associated with different types of criminals, but I have to introduce it in a very twisted and roundabout way. I was once watching an episode of Two Broke Girls, the sitcom, and one character said something to the effect of, This is hard to watch, just like Jim Carrey doing a drama. And Jim Carrey is a very famous comedic actor, but his dramatic films have not been well received by both the critics and the general public. However, I believe that he has been absolutely vilified in the court of public opinion in an unfair way. He did The Truman Show. He did Eternal Sunshine of the Spotless Mind. Those are two films that I love to this day. But he also did The Majestic, which didn't really succeed. He did The Number 23, and that, um also was not a very good one in my opinion, so I think those really took precedence, especially the Majestic, that's the one that everybody thinks about. But in recent years, he did a film called Dark Crimes, and I had heard about it, I had read something about it online, and I didn't even know what it was about, just Jim Carrey is playing this very dark and mysterious character, and it is now available on YouTube movies for free, so I decided to watch it, and it really surprised me in some ways. It is telling the story of this Polish detective played by Jim Carrey, and he's trying to solve a murder mystery. And one of the characters in the movie is named Christoph Kozlov, and he is a writer. And he talks about one possible reason why some people could be driven to commit murder. It starts in the mind. They begin with this type of fantasy, and they begin to relive the fantasy over and over again, to the point where they don't even feel guilt or shame or remorse if they were to actually commit the crime, because they're just going to blame it on their fantasy-filled creation. They're just going to blame it on the fantasy persona, and that really stood out to me. And it turns out Dark Crimes is actually based on a true story the um, real-life murder of Dariusz Janoszewski from Poland, and as I said, the movie's available online for free. There's also a very extensive um, article that's been written in The New Yorker that you can also read that provided the source material for the movie, and that uh, character named Krzysztof Kozlov that I just mentioned is based on a real person named Christian Bala, so inspired by true events, so to speak. But that really got me thinking, though, that particular line about how somebody begins to contemplate, somebody begins to think about criminal behavior and separating themselves from the fantasy persona. And I definitely think that happens a lot more often than we think. And one odd example of this is O.J. Simpson. And I'm fully aware that O.J. Simpson was not a convicted murderer, but most people think he did it. I think that he did it. But anyone who has followed that case knows that O.J. Simpson was on trial for the murders of Nicole Brown Simpson, his ex-wife, and her friend Ronald Goldman. And in one variant of the story, 
O.J. Simpson says, somebody named Charlie came to his home and said that something's going down at Nicole Brown Simpson's house, and then he goes over there with Charlie, and that Charlie's just kind of standing by there while he gets into the confrontation with Ron Goldman, and O.J. Simpson even said that he blacked out. This is all available in the Judith Regan interview, mind you. And people were just wondering, who is this Charlie person, and why is um why is he there? And in the follow-up to the Judith Regan interview, they said they thought O.J. Simpson was talking about himself. They were saying, he's Charlie. And people were like, oh, is Charlie his dark side? No, Charlie was the light side, and he was the dark side. But it's just that same concept creating a fantasy-filled persona who is going to either assist or aid or abet or taking some of the responsibility and the blame. And that one really is a mystery in itself. But that was the first thing that I thought of when I heard that line in the movie um, Dark Crimes. And there's also a possibility, though, that uh, Charlie could have something to do with the serial killer Glenn Rogers, who was known as the Casanova Killer. And I have an episode about that here on Black Box on my radio, and you can always like and subscribe if you want to follow along with these true crime episodes. And if you would like to support all of these efforts, you can go over to buymeacoffee.com. There's a link to that in the description box. Buymeacoffee.com allows you to make a donation or a contribution to help support the show, and anybody who makes a donation will get a shout-out on Zodiac Mondays. There's another odd thing that I need to share with you guys. And about a week ago, I had a dream, but it was a very intense and vivid dream. One of those ones where it feels like it was real life. And there was this woman that was sitting at a table, and she was talking to me, and she had three or four books on the table. And she asked me, actually, why do people commit mass shootings, not even talking about serial killers, not even talking about the um, passion-provoked crimes. Why do people commit mass shootings? I'm having this dream, and a woman is asking me that. And I had to think in my dreamscape, that is, in dream world, I was thinking. And what I said was, first and foremost, there is very frequently a form of sexual intimacy that is lacking in the person's life. There is some type of sexual dissatisfaction going on, and this person is feeling an overwhelming sense of frustration, rejection from society, they are feeling inadequate, they feel that they deserve to be accepted by their chosen sexual partners, but they're not being accepted, and then they are just unleashing their destructive tendencies onto the general public because of frustration, because of sadness, because they fail to achieve something that means that they are somewhat of a worthy member of society. And I don't think we can go any further into this discussion without mentioning somebody named Elliot Roger. Some people just simply refer to him as ER on YouTube because they don't want to get taken down. And he was the Isla Vista shooter, but he wrote a manifesto called My Twisted World, where he more or less explained that exact concept over more than a hundred pages, talking about how and why he planned the Isla Vista shooting, and he did go on to commit suicide. But then there have been other people who have committed similar crimes, such as Alec Manassian in Canada, openly talked about Elliot Roger. And one of the crimes that I was talking about recently on the channel was the Plymouth shooting that was committed by Jake Davison. And his wasn't his motive wasn't exactly the same as Elliot Rogers, but it was all tied into sexual dissatisfaction. Whereas Elliot Roger was talking very clearly about how he was uh, fueled by rage against women because they denied him, and that women were preferring men with brutish characteristics as opposed to a magnificent gentleman such as himself. His words, not mine, he was a terrible person. But Jake Davison talked about more how he didn't look a certain way, therefore he would not ever find love or ever find a partner in life or even ever find sexual attraction, or meaning that other people wouldn't be sexually attracted to him because of the way he looked. And that was just an additional element. He also had a very, very personal issue with his mother because he believed his mother was uh, stealing his 
government benefits, and she was the first victim that he targeted. But, I mean, that really goes to show you that it's not about the way he looked or even attracting a sexual partner. He killed his mother because of an unrelated reason. And the commonalities among Alec Manassian and Elliot Roger and Jake Davison is that they had pre-existing mental conditions, they had pre-existing forms of mental instability, and that's the ultimate issue. There are things like brain chemistry, there are things like lack of social skills and coping skills, and when someone is feeling frustrated, they do not know what to do. And I was watching a discussion that was actually from the White House, but it, it was, there was one of the parents from the Parkland shooting in Florida, uh, Marjorie Stoneman Douglas High School, where it was uh, committed by Nicholas Cruz, and one of the um, people who had lost her child was talking about what could be done in the future, and she said, differentiating between mental illness and mental awareness, mental illness help, as well as mental awareness help, because mental awareness education would be all about what does somebody do when they're just angry, not necessarily dealing with clinical depression or something like that, but when they're angry or they're frustrated or someone is having a rough time in life and those types of coping skills are heavily, heavily neglected in not only conversations but also in the educational system itself. So I think that heavily ties into... Um, about how people do have mental illnesses, and they can be exacerbated by certain things in their environment, such as the lack of a sexual partner, but also mental awareness issues about how when people feel angry and sad and frustrated, and they blame another person for that, someone did something them to them to make them feel that way, they do not know the appropriate ways to respond, or they do not know the appropriate ways to calm down, and the resources that are currently available are insufficient. People can talk about, oh yeah, well, there are hotlines that you can call. They are insufficient. If they were perfect, we wouldn't have these crimes taking place the way they are. I have several episodes on the channel talking about how killers think, and one of them is profiled, the psychology of serial killers and mass shooters. So I've been exploring this subject for a while, and I invite you to listen to some of the other episodes. But I think that point that I always go back to is something that was actually written by Ray Bradbury in his book Farewell Summer when he talked about serial killers. And I, I did an episode about him as well. It's called Ray Bradbury on Serial Killers. And what he said was that a serial killer is a child in a man's body, or I, I believe it's a child in an adult body, a child being forced to live as an adult and child does not have love. A child without love being forced to live in an adult body. And somebody wrote a response comment to that episode saying, there's also this um, symbolic representation in Ray Bradbury's writing. There's a place in the town in Dandelion Wine and Furball Summer, which was the sequel, that's called The Ravine. I mean, it's a ravine, and it's also saying that serial killers almost act like they can float from peak to peak. They can float from the top to the top, and they don't have to actually go into the depths of the ravine, meaning that it's all tying into fantasy-filled delusions, and exactly, exactly going back to the thing from Dark Crimes at the beginning about creating this fantasy-like persona and acting out the um, destructive tendencies and then blaming it on someone else because they're so detached from reality. But I don't think it needs to be downplayed at all, this whole concept, a serial killer is a child without love being forced to live in an adult body, because this is also similar to a proverb that states that the child who is not loved by the village will burn it down to feel its warmth. I absolutely think that that is true as well. But you do hear these stories about not only serial killers, but also other types of criminals, and they have extremely childish behavior. In one of the documentaries I was watching about the serial killer Jeffrey Dahmer, it stated that uh, he was actually interviewed by a priest, and the priest said that after just several minutes with him, he just morphed into this childlike persona, and he's just talking the same way that a five-year-old child would. I'm paraphrasing, but I think you can get the idea. 
And just recently, I was watching a movie that Hulu recommended to me called Girl in the Bunker, which was about the abduction of Elizabeth Schoaf. And it was a true crime case that I was not familiar with. But she was a 14-year-old who was abducted by a man named Vincent Filial, and he brought her to a bunker in the woods, which was more or less um, an underground um, shelter. And he just started talking to her in this very childish way as well, saying, Oh yeah, back when I was in the Boy Scouts, we used to play games and we used to pretend to be Rambo. Did you ever watch the Rambo movies? And once he is in a state where he believes that the other person is not threatening him, he is revealing that he's actually a very childish person. But in all of the situations that I've talked about in this particular episode, very, very heinous and evil things, definitely someone is talking about very destructive and evil actions. I mean, the, these people are murderers and abusers. They just don't have the emotional connection to the victims, or they believe that they have some type of justification or entitled reason to commit these crimes, and that maybe society was mean to them so they can be meaner back. And once they're in this relaxed state, then they can show some type of passion or joy or enthusiasm because they're just expressing emotion all the same but not paying any type of attention or regard to how other people are feeling and this all ties into some things that i've been discussing on the channel very frequently i don't mean to sound like a broken record but i often talk about james h fallon and the psychopath inside which is um pretty much states that that's how the brain of a serial killer functions, all about acting on desire, but not feeling any type of empathy for the victim. Instead, what the person would be feeling is their excitement is fueled by bringing about pain to another person, or in the case of an abductor like Vincent Filial, by controlling another person. And I think that this is um, something that you see time and time again. Again, someone who is not um, a murderer, but Antony Amelia, the M25 rapist, whom I just talked about on the channel. I did an episode about him. And he voluntarily gave a DNA sample to the police, knowing fully well that it would come back positive and that he would be captured. So he abducted a 10-year-old girl, and for the first time during his crime spree as a serial rapist, he told the girl his name, he said, Antony called, told her to call him Tony, and he wanted to be addressed by his name, and he was just being very, um, very playful with the girl, to the point where they almost thought that he was trying to act out a romantic scenario with the 10-year-old girl, and I think that was the driving force behind Antony Amelia's abuse toward his victims, is that he was a pedophile, and he was trying to hide his destructive tendencies, partnered with the fact that he had experienced lots of bullying and lots of uh, rejection, as well as being beaten by his father. So all of those negative factors came together at once. But the, but the sexual t tendencies that he experienced as a pedophile may have been the cornerstone, because... That would have been the driving force to lead towards some type of illegal behavior, no matter what. But he was ultimately captured and convicted. But again, not showing any remorse for the victims. Instead, he said that he was framed, and he said that it was a cover-up. But I noticed that pattern of behaviors again. He's abducted someone, and he was trying to act out a particular fantasy. And you see this all the time. The inability to differentiate between fantasy and reality, where somebody believes that they have this abstraction in their mind, and they want it to be in the external world. The YouTuber Sierra Pine once said that you can think about anything, you can daydream about anything, you can fantasize about anything, no matter what it is, as long as you recognize that it belongs in fantasy world. 
and not in the external world, and I'm sure most medical practitioners would not agree with that assessment, but I can comprehend what she was saying while she was talking about how some people do get caught up in daydreams where bad things happen or some type of, they have a twisted fantasy that is somewhat arousing to them. I do mean that arousing to them, but the majority of people would recognize that you should not try and act those types of behaviors out in the external world because they're hurtful, they're illegal, they're bringing about pain to someone in an undesirable way, and fantasy and reality can go so far beyond that. Some people even just have this fantasy of how the world should be, like that whole thing about how Elliot Rogers is a magnificent gentleman, but in reality he's a social pariah who doesn't have well, any female relationships uh, with intimate partners, but he says that he's a magnificent gentleman and he should have all the women and he should even be worshipped as a god. Well, where is that coming from? It's coming from this fantasy that, you know, he is somebody who is very desirable. And when the fantasy doesn't coincide with reality, then it turns into a very, very angry moment for the person. And I think that is purely back to brain chemistry again. But that would be something about dealing with the relationship in the brain between the amygdala, which controls emotions, and the prefrontal cortex, which a portion of the prefrontal cortex, I should say, that deals with anticipation and decision making. So when someone is uh, experiencing something that they did not anticipate, they get extremely emotional and um Almost always there would be some type of decreased amygdala function, meaning that they have an amygdala that is smaller than normal in the brain. There are reasons why these things happen. There are reasons why people commit crimes, and a lot of it comes back to genetics and neurological functioning, and um, whether or not someone has experienced um, child abuse like in their early years, especially through the years of zero to four. But there can also be traumatic issues that would drive someone to commit crimes later on in life, but the age of zero to four is really when the personality is created. And I want to be clear, after the age of four, abuse can alter somebody's personality because people do have limits. And somebody once recommended that I watch the Robert Sapolsky lectures on schizophrenia, and I did, and they um, wanted me to see and pay attention to a particular detail, and that is that schizophrenia can be awakened in somebody because of traumatic experiences in their youth and really like prior to the age of 30 and in that same lecture the um, professor said very clearly that if you've made it to 30 without experiencing schizophrenia there is a very low chance that you will in the future but it's called dormant schizophrenia it's like the the person has all of the um components in their in their neurological system to be a schizophrenic or to have the schizophrenic um the schizophrenia take shape it's just trauma can expedite the process trauma can turn their uh neurological processes on overdrive and schizophrenia is a psychotic disorder and what happens very frequently in psychotic disorders is the brain starts producing too much dopamine and their system is just going to be absolutely overwhelmed and that's why it leads to all these I have all these expressions that people outside of the person will not understand and they just view as bizarre this can often lead to destructive tendencies homicide suicide or some of the other incidents that we've been talking about, such as abductors, abusers, people who aren't completely aware of the rules of society, or they're trying to act out this type of fantasy and delusion because they can't differentiate between the abstractions of their own mind and the external world. Now, I talked about O.J. Simpson for a little, but he was a accused criminal. He wasn't convicted of the um, murders of Nicole Brown Simpson and Ronald Goldman. Another person who was accused of committing crimes leading to murder was Bruce Ivins, the anthrax killer. And 
again, he wasn't convicted of it. He committed suicide before he could have been arrested. Some people insist to this day that he was innocent. Other people insist that he was guilty. And they made um, a miniseries about the story on, um, oh, um, I believe it was Nat Geo, but then it's available on Hulu and ABC. It was called The Hot Zone Anthrax. And it talks about Bruce Ivan's descent into madness and his mental instability issues. And it just showed how destructive behavior can escalate. But he would have been someone who allegedly mailed in letters containing anthrax. So he is killing people from a distance, but it's tied in heavily to deviant behavior that would have escalated. Someone who is just dealing with the complex structures of a twisted thought process they're becoming more and more out of control. And one reason, one reason that this happens is there are very clear warning signs that somebody is exhibiting destructive behavior and that their destructive behavior is escalating. And I think that many times it is ignored, it is not taken seriously, or people just don't comprehend it. And sometimes, like, I, I do believe it's like, the final statement there that people do not necessarily recognize how someone is is growing in terms of problematic behavior because they don't want to completely uproot their life. And back in 2019, I was talking about Amy Fry Pitson, a woman who uh, committed suicide and her son Timothy Pitson disappeared. And I did uh, three episodes about him, some of those old-fashioned black box recordings. And they aren't really sure what happened, if she murdered him or if she sent him to another family or sent him to some type of religious commune. He disappeared and he has never been found, and then she went on to commit suicide. And I was watching, sorry, I was listening to a podcast, and I forget the name of the show or else I'd give him a shout out. It wasn't Vanished or maybe it was the Disappeared um, podcast into thin air, something like that. But I really wish I could because... The host of that one was just not playing any games with her ex-husband that he was interviewing because her ex-husband is just like, yeah, she, um, she, she, she took the kid and then she committed suicide. There were absolutely no warning signs. We could not have foreseen this. And the interviewer's like, wait a second, didn't she attempt suicide by jumping off a cliff once? He's like, oh, well, yeah, that happened, and she wanted a promotion at work, and she didn't get it, so yeah, yeah, that's true. It's like the person is just not immediately processing it because he doesn't want to have some type of massive overhaul of his life, and people are, again, they're ignoring the warning signs. They're turning a blind eye to them. And it's not clear that Emmy Fry Pitson murdered her son, but some people believe that that is definitely the case, no matter what. She did um, do some types of illegal behavior. But in terms of planning process, I think that revenge is a very, very noticeable and important factor in why people are committing these crimes. And that ties right back to the psychopath inside about how, out of those three issues, genetics, neurological functioning, and child abuse, child abuse is most likely the driving factor that truly, truly escalates someone's deviant behavior. And someone wants to experience, and they want other people to experience the misery that they felt when they were a child. And that just leads to getting revenge on society. Someone believes that they are more intelligent, more superior, more capable. They believe that they are above everybody else, but they want to unleash their destructive tendencies in the shadows late at night when they're abducting someone and then murdering them and disposing of their bodies. And there is this cold, methodical, and calculating reason why they are doing so. And there's also an element of power tripping associated with that, where they can go through normal life, like working a 9-to-5 job, maybe even being married and having kids, and they're just putting on a smile, oh, ha ha, I'm just such a friendly, fun-loving individual. But that's a power-tripping move because they're thinking, only I know the truth about what's really going on. Only I actually know that I'm a serial killer and I have fooled everybody. And then they unleash their destructive tendencies and behaviors 
and no one else is going to be able to stop them or confront them or put an end to it. And I think somebody like Bruce Ivins, if he were indeed the Anthrax killer, would fit into that mold perfectly. But I'll just throw in one little side note. The reasons why people think Bruce Ivins were not the was not the Anthrax killer is because he might may not have had the access to the ex the same types of anthrax that were used in the letters compared to where he was working. And yes, he was a microbiologist, but he may have had access to a different form of anthrax. And they're like, you can talk about uh, mental health issues all day long, but if he didn't have the same type of anthrax and it wasn't him, again, there's some conflicting things, and he was not convic convicted for it, but I have uh, three episodes out about him. Two of them are talking about the show The Hot Zone Anthrax, and the other one is talking about a book called The Mirage Man, which is about um, the anthrax killer. I invite you to check out all of those episodes. So, I think there comes a certain point when we need to look at other types of serial killers, because not every serial killer is someone who is just putting on that nice little gentle facade and then going off and murdering people at night. There are other serial killers out there like Arthur Bomar, the Stone Cold Killer, the Shopping Cart Killer might fit into this one as well, where they are targeting people in a vulnerable position, murdering them, and just simply showing no regard. There isn't so much of a facade as it is they're just murdering people in vulnerable places because they can get away with it. They are so indifferent and apathetic that they just do not care about how and how the victim is going to feel. What Arthur Bomar would do is he would drive up behind somebody on the road and he would just very gently tap the bumper of a woman's car so then she would pull over and then once um, she got out of the car he would just assault her and then ultimately, as his name says, the Stone Cold Killer, he would murder her. But that just goes to show that he most, li he most likely was the type of person who was not living any type of normal um, or gentle, friendly life. He was someone who was an undesirable, unsavory individual. And there are going to be countless people like him who are convicted murderers, who are convicted serial killers, who do the same thing. It's just they're criminal thugs who get out of control. And the example that I always go back to that is uh, Richard Ramirez, the Night Stalker. He was somebody who burglarized people's homes for drug money, and his destructive behavior got out of control. I mean, yes, he had fascinations with morbidity, but I have a fascination with morbidity, and I have never killed anyone, and I'm sure that you do too, if you've made it to this far-off corner of YouTube and you've listened more than 30 minutes into this episode. But you most likely have not killed anyone either. I mean, knock on wood, enriched with possibility. However... Some people don't do that, though. They're just, their criminal behavior gets worse and worse and worse, and nobody is stopping them because it interferes with the emotions that the people in their inner circles are trying to experience. They don't want to face the devastation, so instead they just allow the destructive behaviors to continue to take place. Of course, there are other types of murderers out there, and they aren't always serial killers. There can be somebody who develops a fascination with another person, a stalker, if you will, and he wants to play the game of, if I can't have you, no one will, and I shouldn't say he, because it could also be a she, and they would zone in on a particular person, develop some type of obsession and infatuation with them, but when that person doesn't feel the same way, they then retaliate in a destructive manner, playing the game of, if I can't have you, no one will. And that goes to show you at that point, it's not even about obtaining the person's love. It's not even about romance. It is purely about power, having power over the victims. Money, sex, and power, the trinity of true crime deviants, right? But which one is the most important? Power, because they are trying to gain control of the person, and if they cannot gain control, then the person who is stalking the victim will have them murdered, or they'll murder them themselves, just to prove that they were in control of the situation. Jeffrey Dahmer talked about this very clearly with his victims, saying that 
The only reason why he murdered them was so they wouldn't leave him. And then Jeffrey Dahmer was also a cannibalistic serial killer. And cannibalism is a rare form of domination. It's you've dominated the person to the point where they have the ability to devour them. Absolutely heinous and disgusting behaviors. And that is the stuff that truly makes my stomach turn when I think about um, the crimes and the details that Jeffrey Dahmer... Uh, to his victims and then leaving behind the mummified hands and the cooking pot and absolutely absolutely sick and disgusting stuff but he is not alone he's not the only cannibalistic serial killer out there you also have people like albert fish the uh, moon maniac also known as the gray man the werewolf of wisteria and he is someone who also did terrible terrible things but I have two episodes out on Albert Fish, and my assessment of him was that he wasn't exactly a pedophile. He wasn't exactly a heterosexual or a homosexual. My assessment was that Albert Fish was an autosexual, that he was attracted to himself, and he was just, like, it's the same issues with the power dynamic. He was attracted to his ability to dominate people, and I think all of those reasons tie into being a cannibalistic serial killer are there and you know he's called the werewolf of wisteria and the moon maniac and it was only till recently that i learned that back in the 1800s and perhaps well well before that but even until the 1800s there was still this belief that moonlight made people go crazy and that moonlight would um exposure to the moonlight could affect somebody's temperament and thought processes and well that's why there are names like the Moon Maniac, but Albert Fish actually gets his other nickname, the Gray Man, because a woman once described him as being gray in both demeanor and personality. And they made a movie about him called The Gray Man, which was a rather so-so production because it um, was done a little bit about the serial killer, a little bit about his children, and a little bit about these detectives that are trying to solve the case. And I thought if they had just chosen one particular avenue instead of three small stories, they could have chosen one big story, and it would have been very revealing. So the whole point is there are sexual reasons why people commit crimes, but there's also a power element to the reason as well. And the power element, I believe, is absolutely more important. Some people are only using the sexual aspect so that they will have power over their victims. And that is perhaps the driving force behind a lot of people partnered with immaturity, partnered with this fantasy about how they just want to behave the way they did when they were a child and be accepted by the people around them and be accepted by the um or even if it's not acceptance they just want to dominate the people around them they want to behave the way that they were as a kid and the other people will not be able to reject them because they're too powerful but um what do you think about any of these particular observations and I do have one final note. If you do choose to watch the movie Dark Crimes, there are some deviations from the true story. And um, again, there's an article about it in The New Yorker on the death of Dariusz Januszewski. And all the names have been changed for the movie Dark Crimes. Um, Dariusz Januszewski's name was Sokolov. And Jim Carrey plays this um, detective named Tadek, who is based on a real-life detective named Jacek Robolewski, Tadek Jacek. But an interesting thing in the write-up from The New Yorker was that Wrobel in Polish means sparrow. I didn't know that. They they shared that info. I don't speak Polish. And his name is Jacek Wrobelewski, so Jacek Sparrow easily got the nickname Jack Sparrow. And um, they left that out of the movie as well. And now Christian Bala was convicted for the murder of Dariusz Januszewski. But all I have to say is if you do watch the movie, I don't give away any spoilers, and I take pride in not giving away spoilers. So there are some differences between the movie and the actual true crime story. But I would like to know what you guys think about criminals, serial killers, and human behavior. You can put your ideas in the comments section down below. Share anything that you want. Is there anything that I missed or misinterpreted or left out? And, I mean... 
I'm already thinking of some things that I could have included as well, but I want to hear from you guys in the comments section. Are there any serial killers that um, were not mentioned here that you think are very strong case examples, or other criminals who weren't even murderers, such as um, some of the abductors that I talked about, like Vincent Filial or the rapist um, Antony Amelia? What do you think... Um, what do you think about any of these true crime stories? Please share your ideas in the comments section down below. Anybody can write the show at blackboxonlineradio.com. You can also get me on Facebook. My personal Facebook is in the description box. And there is always blackboxnit88 over on Instagram. And I will see you over there for the bonus podcast. Until next time.